When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and can I just thank you for letting me join you for scripture study each week. And I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for the technology that allows us to come together and study scripture. I'm grateful there's no bell at the end of class uh, that's forcing me to go faster than, than the scriptures would, would want us to. Uh, just yesterday, I was teaching a class in, at BYU on Alma 32, and we had an amazing experience, but it's only 50 minutes long, and I think I got through about half of what I'd hoped. Uh, and so I am grateful for the luxury of time. Uh, I, I know that we take quite a bit of it. Uh, from here on out, perhaps we'll take a little less. I can't make any promises or it's false advertising. Many of you called me out for that at the beginning of our Old Testament year last, uh, last year. But we, won't, we, don't, we no longer have long historical introductions to introduce us to the, the writings and the background and, and audience and, and approach and aim of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've already introduced you to each of them, and I hope that enough of that will stay in your mind that you'll be able to recognize their fingerprints all over the page. Uh, as we started doing uh, last week with the baptism, weaving together these disparate threads from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, bringing in a little John, since he mentions it in John 1 as well, we'll be doing more of that, and it does get tricky because the chronologies don't, don't exactly uh, match. Yeah, I was really wrestling with some of the passages in today's material about the temptations of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about that. But then moving forward, the chronologies start to go in different directions, and the order of events is really hard to nail down. Uh, so we're, we're going to have to excuse ourselves from some of the, the strict historical consciousness uh, to be able to say, well, I don't know if this happened first or that happened first, but they both happened according to these gospel writers, and so let's discuss them uh, in what or, whatever order sounds best to us. Now, speaking of what we did last week, studying the baptism of Christ, one of you reached out and asked an excellent question about John the Baptist's authority. Uh, for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, authority is hugely important. Uh, I could say the same for Catholicism. Uh, Protestantism doesn't care so much. They believe their authority comes from the Bible itself, and as long as we have the Bible, then to borrow from Martin Luther, it's a priesthood of all believers. As I've said before, if the restored gospel is a proving of contraries between Catholicism and Protestantism, we do have as wide as widespread an authority as, as Martin Luther could have hoped for, truly a priesthood of all believers. That's our Protestant side, but from our Catholic side, it does have to be passed down in an unbroken chain. It does have to be authority from authorized servants, okay? And so that was an excellent question. If John the Baptist is baptizing in the, in the River Jordan, are people wondering, where'd you get your authority? Well, the irony is they didn't seem to be wondering and they didn't seem to be wondering about this newfangled approach to religion known as baptism. No, they seemed to come flocking and were more amazed by his, his doctrine. We'll see some of that in, in what Jesus teaches today. But more amazed that he would have the courage to call people out. Uh, this generation of vipers that, we, that, that slithered among us last week. Uh, but the idea of immersing people in water didn't seem to strike anyone as odd. And one of the reasons for that is, in, even in Judaism today, there is something called a mikvah. And a mikvah is, we would consider it a baptismal font. The li literal word, in, or the Hebrew of the word, literally means a gathering, which I think is interesting as we ponder gatherings of Israel and so on. But a gathering of water into some kind of body of it. It can be something small, a pot, uh, a, a font, a pool, a cistern. It can be something large. The word is used in Genesis when it talks about, let's gather the waters together and we'll call it sea. And everything left is the land. And so I think it's interesting that there, even in the idea of a mikvah, you get this, this, this picture of a new creation, a new beginning of it all. And so I think that's fascinating to think about baptism as a new creation, a rebirth as well. Uh, and so in, in the Old Testament, there's much talk of ritual purity. 
of needing to be cleansed. And many times it's being washed in order to be cleansed. The Old Testament doesn't make it clear exactly how that washing is to occur. But by the time you get into this intertestamental period, uh, the second temple period and the time leading up to the New Testament, the uh, Jews are carving out of the rock, uh, digging holes, uh, going to the Jordan. They're finding gatherings of water to use for ritual immersion and ritual purification. And so by the time John is doing that, uh, the Jews would go, oh, okay, he's, he's trying to help us become ritually pure, just like, just like others might. Uh, in some ways, if you think about the Last Supper and the transition from Passover to sacrament, the, Jesus wasn't creating something out of thin air. He was taking an existing practice, the Passover meal, and giving it, infusing it with new meaning and new life and turning it into the sacrament. Yeah, in a similar way, you can see that with John the Baptist going from mikvah uh, and ritual purification to baptism. And it's not baptism into a church. The church isn't there yet. Uh, you could say baptism into the kingdom of God, which is a bigger organization. I don't even know if organization is the right, is the right term, but a bigger kingdom because the king is at hand. And as we saw last week, repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm baptizing you into the kingdom, but not into a church. The way it was always described then is, and we talk about it in the, in the art, fourth article of faith, it's baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. But again, about his authority, where's that coming from? Remember who his parents were. And if Zacharias is, administ is serving in the temple, hmm, he's a priest. And if, remember his mother, uh, Elizabeth, was of the daughters of Aaron. So you don't get higher authority as far as uh, lineage and inheritance is concerned than from Zacharias and Elizabeth. As we saw the, the genealogy of Jesus, that if, if Rome hadn't stepped in, then Joseph of Nazareth could have been Joseph, king of Judah. And in a similar way, John the Baptist could have been high priest if it weren't for the apostate priesthood that was running the show in Jerusalem at the time, the likes of Annas and Caiaphas, it would have been John instead. So no worries about authority. In fact, it's interesting that later in the New Testament, we'll see this later in the Gospels, the people are wondering, scribes and Pharisees particularly, uh, about Jesus, where'd you get your authority? So authority was an issue, it was a question. Where did you get yours? And Jesus' response is classic. We'll get into it more in depth when we get there, but preview of coming attractions. He takes their question about authority and turns it back on them, asking them to answer your own question. But let me uh, replace myself with John. Where he, he didn't say where'd he get his authority, but in, in terms of a question of authority, I think it's, it's implied in the question that Jesus gives in, in response, which was, tell me about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or was it of man? You get a hint of authority there? Did God allow this? Or is this just some kind of man-made thing that he was doing? And I think in a way, what he's... In fact, the way Jesus says it, let me ask you a question. And if you can answer it, then I'll answer your question about my authority. I think re in reality, Jesus is saying, if you can answer that question, then I won't need to answer your question because you will have already answered it for yourselves. So again, the question... You're asking about my authority. I'm asking about John's baptism. Was that from above or from uh, outside? Uh, was he looking vertically to God or horizontally to man? And what kind of authority, what kind of, what source of that power would you, would you name? And what's interesting is the, the Pharisees there, the Jewish leaders, they realize we can't answer that. At least we won't answer that. Because if we say it's merely of men, the people will rise up against us because John is just that popular. You could say similar things of Jesus. Then again, if we say that it comes from God, then Jesus is going to call us out and say, if it comes from God, then why don't you accept it? And in a similar vein, he's talking about himself. I'm not just popular among the populace. This is not simply some kind of mortal people coming, and I, I'm the latest craze in the day. No, my authority comes from God, just like John's did. And that seems to be what, what Jesus is hinting at. The, the, the Jewish leaders walk away with tail between their legs going, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Okay, fine. 
Uh, but we can. And if Jesus is using John for his own backup in some ways, we know Christ has authority. We know that John does too. If you want a clearer answer for this, by the way, you can go to section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. We talked about that at length a couple of years ago. But in section 84, verse 26 through 28 is describing the Aaronic priesthood, sharing, uh, administering the, the ministering of angels, the preparatory gospel, and then says in 27 and 28, which gospel is the gospel of repentance and of baptism and the remission of sins and the law of carnal commandments, which the Lord in his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron among the children of Israel until John. So this is authority, notice, that has been passed down, continues with the house of Aaron until John. Now, was it in a state of apostasy by the time John comes onto the scene? Yes, although ordinances, we could say, are still being performed. Temple rituals are being performed in Jerusalem. Zacharias himself was participating in that. But notice how the verse goes on. So it's continued with the house of Israel among the children of Israel until John, whom God raised up. Think about what Jesus is saying about John's baptism. Does it come from God or does it come from man? Well, section 84 makes that abundantly clear. God raised him up for this, this calling, this mission, this authority. Being filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Now, that's not confirmation, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but to be filled with the Spirit, even in utero. Remember when Mary first comes to see the, the pregnant Elizabeth and she feels the baby leap within her womb? Oh yes, feel, filled with the Spirit and being prompted to respond in a spiritual way to the coming of, of Christ, even within Mary's womb. Then, verse 28 of section 84, For he was baptized while he was yet in his childhood. And would that have been some kind of ritual immersion? Would that have been uh, going to a mikveh? Would that have been performed by his father? We don't know all the details, but here we have it. He was baptized in his childhood, and then even more importantly as far as authority is concerned, and was ordained by the angel of God at the time he was eight days old unto this power. And what power was it? To overthrow the kingdom of the Jews, because a greater kingdom was at hand to make straight the way of the Lord before the face of his people. In other words, to straighten out all the crooked ways that apostate, apostate priesthood was preaching. To make straight the way of the Lord and to prepare them for the coming of the Lord in whose hand is given all power. So John's was a preliminary power, a, a lesser priesthood, an ironic level in preparation for the Melchizedek level that was coming right behind him. Now again, we don't have the details on this. I wish we did. But to think of John at eight days old, and eight is the number for new beginnings, since a week has passed, and day eight is a new day one, new creation. Let's gather the waters, shall we? If you think about eight in a new beginning with circumcision, which is what takes place on the eighth day for a Jewish boy, to take upon him the covenant and the token of the covenant, a new covenant beginning for him on the eighth day, day. You see symbolism in the eighth year, reaching the age of accountability to be baptized. And so this new beginning, and, and at some point that day, that eighth day, he is taking upon himself the covenant with mom and dad's help. He's being circumcised. And at some point then an angel comes to ordain him unto this power. There's authority for you. And it's a power to overthrow one kingdom to make way for another clear out the generation of vipers from the Garden of Eden because the keeper of the garden is coming and he's got trees of life to plant. Two statements from Joseph Smith can also help clarify this if you're still interested. Yeah, he said this, as touching the gospel and baptism that John preached, I would say that John came preaching the gospel for the remission of sins. He had his authority from God. Again, we learned that from section 84. And the oracles of God were with him. And the kingdom of God, for a season, seemed to rest with John alone. This voice in the wilderness. Who else is, is speaking up? No one, it seems. The Lord promised Zacharias that he should have a son who was a descendant of Aaron, on both sides of the family tree. And the Lord, having promised that the priesthood should continue with Aaron and his seed throughout their generations, let no man take this honor unto himself, except he be called of God, as was Aaron, there, Joseph Smith is quoting Hebrews 5.4. It's part of our fifth article of faith, right? And Aaron received his call by revelation. 
So if that was the case in Aaron's day, it's the case in John's day. This is a, a power from above, not, not a power from man. And then later, another statement from Joseph Smith about this. John at that time was the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom there was then on the earth and holding the keys of power. The Jews had to obey his instructions or be damned by their own law. How's that for irony? And Christ himself fulfilled all righteousness in becoming obedient to the law which he had given to Moses on the mount and thereby magnified it and made it honorable instead of destroying it. So even in ritual immersion, to fulfill all righteousness, this was a chance for him not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then I love what the prophet says to conclude this quote. The son of Zacharias wrested the keys. He wrestled them away from apostate priesthood. He wrested the keys, the kingdom, the power, the glory from the Jews by the holy anointing and decree of heaven. The holy anointing? There's the angel coming when John was eight days old to ordain him to this power. And this decree of heaven, well, think of the angel appearing to Zacharias and letting him know that this little boy uh, was meant to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We saw all of that take place last week as Jesus would then came to fulfill all righteousness and be baptized of him. In other words, John performed his mission and was authorized to do so. Just like Jesus, a lamb without blemish prepared from before the foundation of the world, was prepared and authorized to perform his mission as well. In fact, it's with that I'd like to give you one last piece of background before we dive into the, the new material we have for this week. And this is one, shame on me, I should have taught you last week because it's straight out of Luke chapter three uh, it, but it's in the Joseph Smith translation of it. And it serves me right for trying to, to lesson prep in airports and during red-eye flights when everyone around me is sleeping. Uh, and I was probably half asleep myself. I totally spaced this, this Joseph Smith translation uh, excerpt or edition. And it's one of my favorites of all time. So shame on me. Uh, if we can bring it in to begin today's lesson, or at least to con conclude a week later, last week's lesson, this Joseph Smith translation is worth, it's, it's worth the whole project in some ways. There are uh, many uh, a, a, cha a change in the JST that clarify, but occasionally there are tapestries woven out of whole cloth inserted into the text that add such vivid color to what we're seeing. Remember Moses 1 was an example of that. It's nowhere in the Old Testament, and yet it's the JST of where the Old Testament comes from and where it all begins. Uh, Moses 6 and 7, this incredible masterpiece about the visions of Enoch bringing his city up to heaven. Nowhere present in the Old Testament, and there we have page after page of it uh, in the JST. Uh, how little we know about Melchizedek from the Old Testament, and how much we know about him from the JST. So again, there are these places where it's not just a correction, but a, a massive insertion and addition, all by revelation. Uh, nothing on an ancient manuscript that we have to look at, but by revelation, God gives this to the prophet, who then gives it to us. And that's what we see in the JST of Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. It's too long to fit in the footnotes, and maybe that's why I missed it, uh, but it's in the appendix that you'll see uh, these longer excerpts from the JST, and this one is magnificent because it gives us, in the mouth of John the Baptist, that's why I should have brought it up last week, part of his mission was to bear witness of the Messiah and the mission of the Messiah that Jesus would fulfill. I don't know of a single passage in Scripture that does a better job of laying out what being the Messiah would entail for Jesus. In fact, if you count them, and we'll count them together in a moment, there are 10 things that John lists. I call these the 10 commandments of Christ. And compared to his, ours are a cakewalk. Ours, yeah, just don't kill anybody, would you? Can you, can you keep that under control? Don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, honor the Sabbath, honor your parents. Our 10 are pretty simple and straightforward. Compare that to the 10 things that Jesus would have to be able to do. And it's incredible. In some ways, this is the lengthened version of the Father's question in pre-mortality, whom shall I send? Because what he's really asking is, 
Who can do all 10 of these things? And if you study Revelation chapter 5, silence reigned in heaven. As we looked around nervously, desperately, wondering who could possibly do all that. And no one was able, the strong angel says, We'll see, we'll flash back to this when we get to Revelation 5, because that's the fullest version of the war in heaven we have in Scripture. Uh, but to tie Revelation 5 in with Abraham 3, whom shall I send, and now JST of Luke chapter 3, what was the Lord, what was the Father asking for? Well, notice this JST Luke chapter 3, 4 through 10. He's in the middle of describing John the Baptist's arrival, his mission call as it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, And these are the words, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his paths straight. Now that we're totally familiar with. We saw it in so many of the gospel accounts we studied last week. That's straight out of Isaiah chapter 40. This is the, the, the freeway, the, the highway construction that we've talked about so, so often. But then notice, all that's coming is straight out of Revelation to the prophet Joseph. For behold, and lo, he shall come, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Now, is this something that Isaiah is continuing to say, and John is simply quoting a, a portion of Isaiah we don't have? I don't know. On the other hand, perhaps more likely, are there other records that John the Baptist has, is, has knowledge of or access to? And so here it is written in the book of the prophets, plural, is he bringing all these things together. I, we don't know. Is this a text, a literal text that John the Baptist has access to? Or is he creating a text as he weaves together disparate strands of thread from throughout the writings of the prophets? We don't know. But what we have in our final version here are the, are the Ten Commandments of Christ. And here they are. So as it is written in the book of the prophets, this is what he will come to do. Number one to take away the sins of the world. He is coming as a savior after all. And his chief mission, since our chief stumbling block is our own sinfulness, who can go down? Down, literally, condescend to the level of sinners and take those sins away from them. Both the sins and the stains of those sins as Elder Christofferson has said, both the taint and the tyranny of sin, as Elder Bednar has taught. Who can do that? Any takers yet? Number two, to bring salvation unto the heathen nations. Luke would love that. No wonder it's included in his gospel. Uh, the heathen nations, the outsiders, who can bring them in and bring salvation to those further away from the, from the original goal? Number three, to gather together those who are lost, who are of the sheepfold of Israel, yea, even the dispersed and afflicted. Who is the best shepherd to go out and find every lost lamb? Number four, to prepare the way and make possible the preaching of the gospel unto the Gentiles. Again, Luke would perk up about that. The heathen nations, bring them salvation. The, gospel, the Gentiles, shine the light of the gospel even unto them. In fact, building upon that, his fifth commandment, and to be a light unto all who sit in darkness, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Who shines brightly enough to be the light of the world? Who can rise in the east and shine even unto the west and cast out every shadow along the way? Number six, to bring to pass the resurrection from the dead. Who will be able to stare down death itself and back it into a corner? Who will be able to surrender to death and then overcome it from within? Who has power to die, lay down his life, but also power to live, take it up again? Who can do that? Number seven, to ascend up on high to dwell on the right hand of the Father until the fullness of time and the law and the testimony shall be sealed and the keys of the kingdom shall be delivered up again unto the Father. Whew. How's that for a seventh commandment? Who first can descend below all things, but then ascend up on high and bring everyone else with him? 
who can deliver those keys of the kingdom back to the Father saying, the work is done and everyone is coming home. That work is still not finished, but the Lord is still accomplishing it. Number eight, to administer justice unto all. Can you imagine <laughs> being able to do that? So that when all is said and done, everyone feels they've been treated fairly. I can't even do that with my own children. I only have five of them. Imagine the Lord somehow being able to untangle every, <laughs> every knotted cord without just untangling this part and shoving the tangle further off somewhere else on the cord. That happens every time I try to untangle my Christmas lights. Uh, I'm just moving the mess elsewhere. And yeah, I, I, I solved it for you, but it ended up making things worse for someone else. No, only Jesus could come and assume within himself, take upon himself the mess of all mortality and be able to untangle everyone's string to perfection. Administer justice unto all. Yeah, that's a tall order. Or number nine, to come down in judgment upon all. Equally difficult here. And in that judgment, somehow be able to balance justice and mercy perfectly for all. Someone that no one will have any complaints about the way they were treated once all is said and done and they see things from the divine perspective. And then tenth, finally, the tenth commandment for Christ, to convince all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds which they have committed. And all this in the day that he shall come, for it is a day of power. Yea, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways made smooth. Now we're back to Handel's Messiah. Now we're back to Isaiah 40. Was John inserting that right there in the middle of Isaiah 40, was, it's such a magnificent passage. That last one, just to say briefly about it, to convince the ungodly of their ungodly deeds. If it's one thing we tend to hold on to, it's, it's our own transgressions. And we don't call them transgressive. We justify, we rationalize, we, we avoid condemnation at all costs. But for Christ somehow to be able to convince us that he was right and that we were wrong. For us to finally submit and surrender, wave the white flag, in Christ's case, probably the red one, the crimson one, admitting that he was right and we should have followed and that he's given us every opportunity. Now again, if you put this JST insertion in the middle of the drama of Revelation chapter five, as this strong angel takes the book with the seven seals from the hand of the Father and says, who is worthy to open this book? And the book represents the mission call of the Messiah. Who is worthy? Notice the angel is strong, but not strong enough to open the book, not strong enough to unseal the seals. We're not looking for strength. We're looking for worthiness. And who's worthy to do all that? Who's worthy, willing, able, to perform this saving work. And in Revelation 5's account, no one was. Do, you, do we understand? Our turn on earth would mean nothing if Christ hadn't taken a turn to come as well. Ours would have been a descension with no ascension if it weren't for his condescension. And so, as the heavens wept according to Revelation 5, and wondered. There's no coming home if we leave. No wonder people started gravitating towards Satan's plan. If no one can pull this off, then this is a one-way trip. It's not round trip. We'll never come back to be with God, let alone like him. Lucifer's option now is starting to sound pretty appealing. But then in the midst of it, silence only broken with sobbing and tears. The angel, the strong angel, finally says to reassure us, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book with the seven seals, or to borrow the language of JST Luke 3, 
The Lamb of God has come. That's John's language. To lay down his life and to do everything God is expecting of him. Christ will keep all ten commandments to make up for every commandment we don't keep. I testify of that. Can you see why I love this JST edition so much? I am grateful for so much of the truth and powerful testimony that we've received through the work of the Prophet Joseph Smith. This to me is an absolute gem amidst an incredible treasure trove. And with that, we're ready to move forward. This week, we study the temptation of Christ, the calling of the initial apostles. We saw some of that, some of that hinted at in John chapter 1, not hinted, it described in John chapter 1. But we'll see Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version of that today. The first half of what we'll study will be the temptations. The second half, we'll see this. We'll see Christ at his own home synagogue in Nazareth. The scene there, talk about drama. It's amazing. Hold on for that. And then the calling of fishers of men. And the beginning of the Savior's mortal ministry all unfolds in the material we'll study this week. It's Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and 5, although we'll bring in a little bit of of Mark 1 uh, to, to round it all out. Uh, And if you remember from the end of last week, we concluded with the baptism of Christ. And immediately after that commitment, here comes the contention uh, from the adversary. As soon as the Lord has has planted his banner in the soil and said, "Here here I stand and I will not be moved. Well, here comes the tempter in an attempt to move him. You see that clearly in Mark's beginning of all of this. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. This is right after the phrase, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father speaking of the Son, or to the Son at the baptism. But then Mark's account says, And immediately, remember that's the word Mark loves to use because this is a fast-paced gospel. Immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. The JST of that actually clarifies Satan seeking to tempt him. Ah, you you thought you were tempting me? Ah, You're trying to anyway, but I'm not interested. I'm not tempted by your temptations at all. Keep going in Mark. And And Jesus was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. And I do love the timing we see here, the immediacy of it all, that you're going to get whiplash turning so quickly from baptism to temptation, which sadly is so true to form. Elder Holland gave a magnificent talk years ago. He's given a lot of them, right? Uh, But one of his masterpieces was called, it's a a mouthful, Cast not away therefore thy confidence. It had to be that long because it's a phrase from Paul and Elder Holland wanted to quote the whole thing. But this thought of not casting away your confidence The way Elder Holland described it is right on the heels of powerful experiences and deep commitments. Satan comes rushing in, in hopes of nipping that in the bud. The last, Satan hates good direction, but even good direction can be stopped if it's not followed with good momentum. You understand the need for both? We need direction and momentum. Jesus has direction. He always does. But as far as baptism is concerned, okay, I'm setting my sights on the kingdom of God. And I'm here to proclaim it and usher it in. So I'm faced in that direction steadfastly. No wonder Satan comes in immediately and says, fine, you might be looking in the right direction, but if you're not progressing towards it, then big deal. There's still no movement And so Satan comes right on the heels of this commitment. We saw the same in Moses chapter 1. As soon as Moses has his epiphany with God and understands his purpose in life, then the adversary comes immediately saying, Oh, son of man, worship me. We'll see similar things here. If you felt opposition right on the heels of your own baptism, if you felt challenges begin the moment you sent in your mission papers, if some of the challenges of marriage followed quickly on the heels of your sealing in the temple, well, welcome to the norm as far as the adversary is concerned. But what's also normal is for us to be presented with choices every step of the way between wilderness as a good thing or as a bad thing. 
wilderness as a heaven or a hell. A wilderness where there will be angels to minister, but also wild beasts to come growling in your direction. I always find that interesting. He was with the wild beasts. Lucifer himself is one of the ultimate examples of that, right? A roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It actually makes me wonder. There's amazing examples in the Old Testament, for example, of people with the wild beasts. Is Jesus going to be a Samson attacked by a lion in the vineyards of Timnath? Or is Jesus going to be a Daniel surrounded by the lions in the den that do him no harm? Will this be the young David with the lion and the bear who he overcomes in preparation for facing his giant? Oh yes, Jesus is there in the wilderness and he chooses the angels. He overcomes the wild beasts. He starves the natural man within him. There's a beast for you. And it does. It's wild because we so often let it run wild within. But not Jesus. The Luke account, by the way, begins in a similar way. We're going to spend most of our time in Matthew, but we'll at least let Luke introduce it as well. He says, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost which is exactly what should happen after we're baptized, right? That's step four in the fourth article of faith, receive the Holy Ghost. But as soon as, as Jesus is filled with the Spirit, he returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And this story is often running. Notice the Spirit is what drew him into the wilderness a place of purification and preparation, as wildernesses typically are. We've mentioned it before. There's the pioneers trekking west. There's Joseph in the sacred grove. There's missionaries at the MTC. There's the places we go to wean ourselves off the wicked world and cut off all distraction until it's just us and the angels. I, I miss wilderness experiences. And if you think about the children of Israel in their 40 years of wilderness wandering, wander, wander, die, wander, die, well, the, the wild beasts within us are supposed to die off during that period so that then we can get to the Jordan River and cross it and come into a land of promises, promises we intend to keep. But we will be tested in the process. And that's what's happening with Jesus. So Matthew 4, let's use this account. It's the, in many ways the fullest one. Begin verse 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Now pay attention to the directions as we see them in this account. The ups and the downs particularly. Which direction does the Spirit want to take Jesus? Up. Take him up into the wilderness. Now the, most, the Matthew version goes on, took him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And it's like, oh great, you, you set up a, a, a booby trap for me? brought me out here and then left me right there facing the adversary himself? No, that's not the case. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, what is lead us not into temptation, no, that, that's not exactly accurate either. That's not the business God is in. The tests will come without him forcing us into harm's way. Sadly, we end up wandering there ourselves so frequently. So here's a place where the JST does some correction rather than wholesale addition. Rather than being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, the JST says, to be with God, which sounds more like what the Spirit is always after. Come this way, and you will be with God. Come into the wilderness. Leave the wicked world. You see, even after your baptism, there will remain periods of purification to undergo. You've been justified at baptism, but what about sanctified? Not there yet. So keep coming into the wilderness as often as you need. Keep coming up. Keep following the Spirit. Keep passing tests that will <laughs> inexorably come your way. Now verse 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. There's a JST correction to that as well. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and had communed with God, that's what he'd been doing all this time. He was afterwards and hungered and was left to be tempted of the devil. Interesting change there. The 40 days weren't spent 
going mano a mano with, with Lucifer, those 40 days were spent communion with God. And isn't that what fasting prepares us for, perhaps better than most other things? Silence the flesh. It takes a while to do so. It takes a while for that wild beast. I mean, it does growl at you, doesn't it? <laughs> the stomach within just growl, snarling, growling at you. Feed me. Feed the natural man. Feed the flesh. And so often it takes a while for that, that beast to be lulled into sleep realizing that is my master and I don't growl at it. It controls me. The spirit must be willing, especially when the flesh is weak. The spirit has to be in charge. And so those 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is strengthening his spirit at the expense of the flesh. He is training the body that he's received. These swaddling clothes, the word made flesh, but who's going to be in charge? The word will. And his word will stand. And when his word speaks to the growling beast within, the flesh with all of its hungers, the Logos will say absolutely no. That's what Fast Sunday is our chance to practice. And if you do it for three and a half years, there's 40 days and 40 nights. We just don't do them consecutively. Okay? For us to have practice days, that's what we're trying to do too. We are communing with God. What's interesting is it's only afterward that Jesus is hungered. It's only afterward that he's left to be tempted of the devil. Now, a couple of things here. One uh, is, this, is the adversary's timing. Because we just saw, again, cast not away therefore thy confidence, and, and Satan's just ready to, ch he's chomping at the bit to dive in and stop momentum from building. So he's doing that. And I can just picture him going, no, wait, wait. Wait till the end. He's going to be at his absolute lowest ebb. He will have no strength to resist. He'll be on death's doorstep physically. Oh, Satan, you don't get it, do you? At his lowest physically, you're probably right. But at his absolute highest spiritually. I've found that often it's only after I'm breaking my fast that I realize just how hungry I've, I've been. I'm usually hungry at the beginning. As It's more like I'm scared of like, I've got to do this for 24 hours, or it's going to be a long time since, until I have another meal. And it's like my, my, the, the wild beast within is, is whimpering and snarling and like, you, you can't do this to me. Please don't. It's hard at the beginning until I starve the natural man enough that I put him in his place and he's more docile. He's the one that doesn't have any strength. And spiritually, man, by the end of the, the, the fast, in some ways, it's like, I mean, I could, I could, let's, should we do it another day? You understand? Satan just doesn't understand the power of the Spirit. Never did. And so for, to attack at that moment, the Lord, oh, I'm ready for you now, more than ever. Now, to a Jewish, the other thing I wanted to mention, to a Jewish audience, and that's Matthew's audience as he's writing this. As soon as they hear that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, who do they think of? They think Moses. And sure enough, this is a Moses 2.0. The true lawgiver coming down from Sinai. Moses went and into the mountain to commune with God, to receive his law, and came down 40 days later having fasted. Right after this chapter, Matthew 4, is Matthew 5. As Jesus comes to the mountain to give them the new law, the Sermon on the Mount. The parallels here are fascinating. And so for the Jews to think, in fact, Moses did it twice, right? Uh, golden calf experience in between. And to see Jesus beginning his ministry in similar ways. Elijah did the same at the same place. And Elijah, remember John the Baptist was a rough-hewn Elijah, a new Elias. But Jesus was an Elias of sorts as well. And so for Christ to come to end an apostasy in Israel, that's what, that was Elijah's hope in his day. And so all these parallels is, is, are truly fascinating. But one other thing about the temptation that Jesus is about to face, Satan believes he is as hungry as he'll ever be. No better time to come and attack with some kind of lust of the flesh. If you read the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, 
it describes sin pretty powerfully. And it fits in with what we saw in, this, in, this, in these verses so far, especially the JST additions to it. James says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So that's James's version of Joseph's correction. Like, no, 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 he's not being led by the Spirit to go be tempted by the devil. That's not how God works. James is saying likewise. And then James teaches this, and it's, I don't know if, it's, if this is taught better anywhere else in the Scripture than here. James 1 verse 14, But every man is tempted when two conditions are present. Here it is. Number one, when he is drawn away of his own lust. And number two, enticed. You see, the first half, drawn away of his own lust, that's hunger. And the second half, enticed, that's bait. And when those two come together, that's when temptation occurs. Because the object of our affection is right in front of us. The thing we're hungering for is now present, the enticement. And I'm actually hungering for it. There's the lust, the drawn away from, by it. If you think about what the adversary is hoping for, that Jesus has been drawn away into the wilderness. Okay. Can we draw him deeper into it to the point that he begins to hunger after things that aren't, aren't nearby and then somehow present them to him? No wonder Satan is wait, who's waiting. Let's get to him to the point where, that, where lust can finally hatch within Jesus and he's going to be as hungry for something as ever. And then let's tempt him. Let's offer the bait. If, you, if you're a fisherman or a fisherwoman, if you, if you are trying to catch things, you know the principle that James teaches is true. You have to have convincing bait. But the fish also have to be hungry. Or you'll come home without anything saying, ah, the fish just weren't biting today. Satan was hoping that Jesus would bite. And now he comes with the bait for Jesus to bite on. Verse 3, when the tempter came to him, Luke's version, by the way, just calls him the devil. But tempter? Oh, we know exactly who Lucifer is here. What a revealing title. Don't trust him. You know exactly what he's doing. You knew what I was when you picked me up, is the famous statement. So the tempter comes. Anything that comes out of his mouth, no matter how smooth it is, there's a temptation lurking somewhere behind it. So don't fall for it. You know who he is. The tempter came to him and said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You can provide the bait for yourself. I'm just suggesting it. But notice how he's doing it. The initial word from the adversaries, the tempter's lips, was if. Pay attention in the Gospels to the word if whenever it appears. There's some fascinating insights hidden behind a two-letter word you will see very similar, almost identical ifs at the end of Christ's ministry when he's suffering on the cross. And the people there at the base are taunting him, wonder, asking him, if you're the Son of God, then take yourself down from the cross. If you have the power you claim to, then use it to save yourself. Do you see how this is coming full circle? That's the first temptation of the adversary and the last temptation of those that are serving him. And both beginning and end and every moment in between, Jesus is able to overcome those temptations. But that's a huge if. If thou be the Son of God. I mean, if, if you have all power, if you're a God, or at least his Son, who better to use the power on than yourself? I mean, if a God can't use his power to, in self-promoting, self-gratifying ways, then what was the good of having all that power? You start to sense... Satan's mentality, that no wonder he approached the, the pre-mortal plan the way that he did. It was all about him. I want to be the go-to guy. I want the glory. I want, so I'll do it my way and have my plan, and I'll take the Father's glory and ultimately the Father's throne in the process. It's about me. It's a self-serving kind of Messiah that, that Lucifer was offering to be, but not Jesus. I'll descend below all things in order to bless everyone else that's now above me. 
It was never about him. And it's certainly not going to be about him now. So that's one side of this temptation. In a way, this is an interesting reversal of the Jacob and Esau story from the Old Testament that Matthew's Jewish audience probably would have thought of. To think in that case, well, Esau's the bad guy. He didn't realize how important the birthright was. And so what did he do? He sold it for a mess of pottage. Well, in this case, it's not that Jacob was the tempter there, but Lucifer definitely is the tempter here. And what's he offering Jesus? A mess of pottage. Just a stone sandwich. Turn these rocks into bread and feast. Satisfy your physical hunger. And yet Jesus, unlike Esau, sees right through it and says, mere pottage? No. I will hold on to my birthright. And it's that birthright that's the other half of Satan's temptation. Because he's ifing it. He's asking, he's wondering, he's trying to get Jesus to doubt. Am I the son of God? Because if you are, you'll have the power to do this. So prove it. Prove that you are. Now we're going to see the Lord's response to it in just a second. But before we do, can we sit with the stones for a moment longer? Because on the one hand, what did, we just heard about stones in the previous chapter with the baptism of Jesus. When Matthew, excuse me, when John the Baptist has said, don't, even, don't think that you're better than other people just because you're seed of Abraham. Because from these stones, God can raise up seed unto Abraham. Now, if God can do that, <laughs> certainly you can turn some of these stones into bread. It's amazing the power God has to touch rocks and make them glow. Ask the brother of Jared about that. To raise up of stones seed unto Abraham. At the triumphal entry, as the Pharisees say, tell these people to stop. They're proclaiming you the king of kings. And Jesus is like, well, yeah, they should. And if they don't, then the very stones around us will erupt in praise for their creator. It's amazing the power of God to do exactly that. But not in some kind of self-serving way. Not to prove to people that I really am the Son of God. No, I'm not touching stones to shine light on myself. I'm trying to help you bring some light into your darkness. It is amazing what God can do with mere rocks. But there's another way to look at it as well. And that's to think about the kinds of stones that Satan throws at us. The kinds of things that he does. I mean, you think of Stephen being stoned in the book of Acts. Here Jesus is, if this is a stoning of sorts that the adversary is attempting. And if I can just get you to think that you can find spiritual sustenance out of mere stones. He's going to be throwing them in our direction left and right. It's tragic to see us pick up worldly rocks and think we will be able to satisfy spiritual hungers. Because it's impossible. What do the angels say to the women at the empty tomb? Why seek ye the living among the dead? <laughs> You'll never find life in a dead place like this. You will never gain calories out of concrete. <laughs> there is no refreshment in a rock. So drop it and move on and seek life in living places. I hope we can do a better job of avoiding the stones Satan's throwing at us. Don't sink your teeth into them. I'll just put it like that. By the way, Matthew's version, stones is plural. Command these stones be made bread. Whereas in Luke's version, he simply says, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Just one. Probably picked one nice and round that kind of looked like a roll. Or maybe one that was kind of curved. Here's a croissant. Just some, let your mind wander. And just this one little pebble. Oh, make it a morsel and satisfy self. It's interesting that if Satan can't bury us with, uh, among the boulders of temptation, because that's just, that's too shock and awe. It's like, no, I would never do all those things. Okay, fine. How about just this one? Just lower your defenses, lower your standards, just this once, or in this one thing. 
it's almost negligible compared to all the good that you're doing. Just one little rock. And yet, what does the Lord say in the Doctrine and Covenants? I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Not a single stone, not one little pebble. I won't succumb to a thing. And Jesus is just that perfect and striving to help us perfect, become perfect even as he is. So how does Jesus respond? Verse 4, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice the first phrase out of the Lord's mouth. It is written. So he's not speaking here. He's quoting here. And what is he quoting? He's quoting scripture. We'll see that the specific verse in just a moment. But even the, the realization that how does the Lord fight the adversary with the word of God? I mean, think about it. The armor of God is mostly defensive. And you have a helmet of salvation to protect the head and a breastplate of righteousness to protect the chest. Your loins are good about with truth and your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But it's, and you have a shield of faith that seems to protect everything. But all of that is merely defensive when I played football, I had pads for just about everything. But to just to sit around and wait to get hit, that's kind of rough. Sometimes you want to initiate. And it's not just defense, it's offense. And so you do get one weapon in the armor of God, the sword. And what does the sword represent? The spirit and the word. The word makes it strong and the spirit makes it sharp. And together it can cut asunder all the wiles of the adversary. It can cut to the chase and help you see what things as they really are. And that's what the Lord is doing. He is wielding the word. And as the word made flesh, no one has ever been more adept with this armament than he. To understand what he does in all three temptations, he unsheathes the word of God and fights back with the word and with the spirit. Know your scriptures. There's the word. And know which one applies in any given moment. That's the spirit. You can have the entire arsenal at your command, but you have to know with the spirit's help which verse applies to this situation Otherwise, the word alone might point you in all kinds of different possible directions. Now, let the Spirit determine this is the verse for this moment. And what was the verse for this one? Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Listen to them in their entirety, because Jesus is just dropping hints. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee, these forty years in the wilderness. Sound like forty days in the wilderness? To humble thee to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And Jesus is accomplishing all of that during this period. He's being humbled. He's proving himself. He's humbling himself, proving himself, showing God what's in his heart. We saw that in the baptism and how Jesus was fulfilling all righteousness by condescending to come down to that level proving that he would be humble, that he would witness unto the Father, that he would keep his commandments in all things. That's what the Israelites were doing through their years of wilderness wanderings. Keep going in Deuteronomy, though. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. I love that the Lord picks that verse to push back against the adversary's temptation. I'm not going to live by bread alone. I'm going to live by the word that comes from the mouth of God. As far as the bread alone, that's the irony. They were told, don't live by bread alone when they were given bread from heaven every day. Bread alone? That's a, they only got bread alone. Yeah, there was the quail miracle too, but for the most part, 40 years, man, I hope there was some manna helper or manna pot pie or just something you could do with it besides just scoop it up and, and force it down. The Lord was teaching them though, every one of these morsels 
comes with commandments. And will you learn to keep them? Will you gather just the day's allotment? Will you not go out seeking things on the Sabbath? Will you get the double portion the day before? Will you act quickly since if, you not, if enough time passes in the day, the manna simply melts and you've missed your opportunity? There were so many lessons we studied last year about the manna. This is the one that the Lord is drawing upon. Even though God was giving them bread, and though I haven't had any for the last 40 days, it's God's word that I've been feasting upon. We'll see this in John later. My meat is to do the will of my Father who sent me. <laughs> oh, I'm stuffed. Ah, all that I've been doing these last 40 days. I'm not interested in what you're offering me. But one other thing that I think the Lord is hinting at. I won't live by bread alone. That's how I'm saying no to you in this temptation of change stones to bread. But living by every word that proceeded forth from the mouth of God, that overcomes your, the other half of your temptation. Remember what it was? If you are the Son of God, He's not just preying upon our weaknesses, our behaviors, our self-centeredness or self-servingness. He's preying upon our identity. Are you really the Son of God? That's Esther. That's uh, Daniel, that's the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's all the, it's Joseph in Egypt. It's any Israelite in enemy territory where names are changed and identities are robbed and say, you are not, this, this is Satan with Moses. You are not a son of God. You're a son of man. So worship me. <sighs> to the same with Jesus himself. You're not the son of God. If you are, then prove it. Prove you have the power. And when the Lord says, A, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to live by bread alone. B, I know who I am. Because I live by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And what's the very last word that had proceeded forth from the mouth of God? Just a chapter earlier. Remember what precedes the temptations? The baptism. And what had the Father said? Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How, oh, Lucifer, I have been living off that, those divine words for the last month and a half. I am God's son. He said so. And there's no if about it. No wonder Satan had to change his tactics. Darn it. He knows. Okay, fine. So temptation number two. Verse 5 and 6, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Wow. The adversary, the devil, the tempter, taking you to the temple of all places? No, look for the JST. Then Jesus was taken into the holy city, and the Spirit setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. Then the devil came unto him and said, and here comes temptation number two. But you see what the adversary is after? See, it, what's amazing to me is, A, Jesus doesn't stay there in the wilderness, surrounded by stones that, yeah, maybe do kind of look like rolls and bagels and bread loaves. And, no, 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 quit thinking. I'm not going to stay here, stand here, and, and rationalize things. I'm not going to reason with the devil. The Lord says he'll come and let us reason together, but he doesn't stay and reason with the adversary. Nope, I'm out of here. He gives an absolute no. Quotes the perfect scripture to do it, and then leaves at the Spirit's direction. In fact, where does he go to? The temple. If you are facing temptation, and both the hunger and the bait are present, and you're like, uh-oh, this is, this is a tinderbox. This is exactly what can't happen. If I weren't hungry, I could hang around the, the, the stones. And my lack of hunger would offset the abundance of bait. Or vice versa. If there were no bait around, then I could be as hungry as possible, and I, I can't satisfy it. So I guess I haven't sinned. In this case, the hunger and the bait are right there. So what does Jesus do? He leaves and goes to a place, a new place, where he can be with God. That's what he had tried to do by going into the wilderness, out of the world entirely. Well, I'm still out of the world, even though now that I'm back in it, as long as I'm at the house of my father. So the spirit brings him to the temple, sets him on the pinnacle, and then the devil comes and says, if thou be the son of God. 
seriously? Did you not catch my hint? The last scripture that I quoted? I am. He just said so. You don't think I can remember the, the passing of one page? <sighs> if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You see, two can play that game. You know your scriptures? Well, so do I. You quote Deuteronomy, I'll quote Psalms. And Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Oh, there's some more stones here, I guess. These aren't the stones to satisfy you. These are stones that really would hurt. And of course, your precious Father in heaven wouldn't let anything happen to his dear little son. Well, if you're that confident, then prove that too. In fact, this wouldn't even be self-serving, would it? I mean, yeah, I guess when, he, when they come in and save the day and you don't end up getting hurt from this headlong leap from the Temple Mount. I guess that is a little self-serving. But really, this is a, as selfless a demonstration of your glory as you could ask. Because we're, we're at Times Square. We're, we're, well, watch the ball drop. Well, let's watch you drop. And all the world will be gathered there. This is the most populous place in Israel. And there at the pinnacle, everyone's going to be looking up and seeing the man teetering on the edge. People seem to be drawn to, we've got rubberneckers drawn to those kinds of spectacles. Especially the thought of what might happen then take the lordly leap. And as you are plummeting to the earth and all eyes are fixed on you as you descend, imagine the shock and awe of all these people you care so much about, these same people that you are trying to convince that you're the Messiah. <laughs> well, when the angels come swooping down to bear you up, Mission accomplished, my messianic friend. Everything you've been waiting for will take place. Talk about jump-starting the kingdom of God. Then jump. Start. Let's get going. You understand what an interesting temptation this would be? People could know. What a temptation it must have been for a Jacob or a an Alma to just, I mean, signs are what Sherem and Korahor were asking for. In, those, in that case, they left it with God. And God did provide the sign. It didn't change their heart. But maybe it woke up the people. In this case, would it change the people's heart? Or would they be shock and awe? Okay, this guy is amazing. This evil Knievel leap and somehow survived it. Maybe we should take him seriously. But is, which sense is that appealing to? A sense of the obvious or a sense of the spirit that confirms truth in small and simple ways? No, I can't leapfrog a longer process by leaping from the temple. I won't do it. Well, how does the Lord respond? Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. Luke's version, it is said. Either way, take the, the oral tradition, take the written word. Either way, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus is back to drawing on Deuteronomy. This time, chapter 6, verse 16, which says, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God, as ye tempted him in Massa." You see, so many times the Israelites tempted the Lord they, they, their God because they didn't have food and they didn't have water. Now we're back to temptation number one. Uh, Jesus knows his scriptures perfectly. And yeah, adversary, you might rest the scriptures to your own destruction. You might cherry pick verses out of context and try to throw them in my face to justify things. And sadly, people have done that through so much of, of religious history also. If I can find, this is, that's, that's the word devoid of the Spirit. That's the rusty sword. 
That's turning it back on yourself. It's using scriptures in ways that were not intended. And that's what the adversary did with Psalms. And so the Lord responds with a correct verse. I will not tempt the Lord my God. It's actually interesting to compare use of scripture here. Because the scripture the devil used was based on rewards. And the verse the Lord used was based on responsibility. Satan focused on blessings. Jesus focused on commandments. Satan, what's in it for me? The Lord, what would the Father have me do? So back to the drawing board, Mr. Devil. What do you have up your sleeve next? Third temptation, verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. Now, by now, we should probably expect a JST because we know that the Lord doesn't follow the devil around. He doesn't go at his bidding. And sure enough, there's a JST that corrects it. Jesus was in the spirit and it taketh him up to this exceeding high mountain. Okay? Again, he's leaving, even though it was at the temple, good place, but the adversary even attacked me here, then I'll leave and go somewhere even higher, an exceeding high mountain. The mountain of the Lord, well, he's got a lot of them. So he goes up with the Spirit's guidance to this mountain, and the Spirit showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now it makes you wonder, what's the Father's intent in having the Spirit bring Jesus up and show him the kingdoms of the world. In, this, in, in some ways, is this your mission call, son? This is your mission, your mission area? Please don't think that you're confined just to the Israelites. You are going to save the, the heathen, the Gentiles, everyone being gathered into the kingdom of God. In my greeny area, as a brand new missionary, uh, just outside San Juan, still urban area. I remember early on my trainer taking me to the tallest apartment building in, in that part of town and opening up the windows when we got to the top and looking around in all directions to see our responsibility, to see the field of our endeavor. And boy, did the weight start to rest upon my shoulders. These are the people I'm supposed to, that I'm called to care for. And for Jesus to be taken to this high mountain, to be shown all the kingdoms of the world. Again, part of it, this is what you're responsible for. Maybe this is what you're up against. Maybe this is the competition or the opposition because th those are the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Well, thy kingdom come. You're going to bring a true kingdom of godly glory that will overcome all these kingdoms of the world. But there, while he's looking, that's when the adversary comes. The JST says, And the devil came unto him again and said, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Oh, there's another if, but it's a different one. I'm no longer questioning your identity. You seem to be convinced of that. But can I question your commitment to godly behavior? Can I question what you're going to do? So if you'll fall down, if you'll come to my level, if you'll worship me, look what I can give you. All of this. Now it's interesting because with the help of Luke, we see two added details. Number one, when he's shown all the kingdoms of the world, the Luke account says he showed it in a moment of time. And again, that's either God showing all of this and helping him see the, the vast expanse of his re responsibilities. This is like Moses chapter 1 when Moses sees everything, every particle of the earth, every person upon it. Uh, that would have to be sped up time right there. And in an instant, all of a sudden, he sees it all. And these are the people I'm, I've, co I've come to, to save. Wow. On the other hand, is this the adversary showing all his kingdoms and it only takes a moment to do so because that's as long as they last. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go, an hour of pomp, an hour of show. That's all it is. It's, a, it's the foam on the wave. It's a bubble and it's about to pop. Think about housing bubbles and... <laughs> economic bubbles that then burst and leave people worse off than when they started. 
be aware of just how fleeting the world's glory is and let the kingdom of God come with its eternal glory. That's one hint Luke gives us. The other, Luke 4 verse 6, when the adversary says, worship me and I'll give you all this power, he says, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. And I want to give it to you now, if you'll just worship me. Now, one thing you have to know, because this is interesting doctrine. Wait a minute. Satan has power. He has uh, glory. He has control over all of this. Thus, it was delivered unto me. Really? Well, he does claim to be the God of this world. But was glory and power over it given to him? Please remember... When you first met him, he was called the tempter. Don't fall for everything he says. Don't believe that he's being honest here. Oh, no, it's mine. The other thing, though, interesting, his language, this power and this glory. That perfectly describes what Lucifer was after all along. War in heaven, I want God's glory. I want God's power. So give it to me. And he's assuming that Jesus would want the same thing. I mean, you won the war in heaven. <laughs> Certainly, now you're getting all the power and glory. I can give you even more of that. And the Lord would say, that's not why I agreed to be the one to come. That wasn't it at all. There's actually another interesting irony there. <laughs> to say, worship me and I'll give you all these worldly kingdoms. I could picture the Lord with a smile saying to him, A, they're not yours to give. And B, even if they were, they're going to be mine anyway. <laughs> What's the prophecy about the second coming and the millennial reign? The kingdoms of this world will become, can you hear Handel's Messiah? This, this is a great song for this one too. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. In other words, what you're offering me Lucifer is something that's already been promised me and it will come in the Lord's time and in the Lord's way. In the war chapters in the Book of Mormon, I, off the top of my head, I should have looked this up. I can't remember who the enemy is, if it's Amalekiah or if it's Amaron, one of their kind. Uh, and with Captain Moroni bearing down on them, they, they say, well, look, we'll surrender this city if you'll give us all of, all, all, all of our prisoners of war back. Just fair exchange. And the Nephite general just kind of laughed and said, uh, nice offer. I don't think you have the manpower to defend that city anyway. And so we'll keep our prisoners, thank you very much, and we'll conquer your city. How's that for a win-win for us and a lose-lose for you? And he totally called their bluff. Because as the army was coming, what did the Lamanites in the city do? They fled, they surrendered, they turned tail and ran. Sure enough, they didn't have the men to defend it. So don't fall. You see what the adversary is doing? Exactly what he's, it's all, it's all bluff and bluster. It's, I'll give you all of this if you just do it my way. And it's like, no, it, I can get it the right way. I actually remember this hitting me really strongly when I was teaching teenagers. And at that age, teenagers and young adults, so often the stones to bread temptation is so strong within them when it comes to morality. And it's, it's sexual hunger they want to satisfy. That's the bread they're after. But unfortunately, that's, that's a hard rock to swallow if you're trying to consume it outside the bounds the Lord has set. But the irony of it is, if you'll stay within the Lord's bound, He offers it to you. That human intimacy, marital intimacy, is a gift of God, but it's confined to marriage. And within those confines, there is no more glorious gift that God gives us to allow us to become one with each other and one with Him in an act of creation, which is God's territory. As I tried to explain to these youth and young adults, Satan is trying to get you to take something that God has already promised. And if you'll simply wait 
The kingdoms of the world will be Christ's. And all that the adversary is offering you prematurely will come in the Lord's right way. There will be no bitter aftertaste because it's real bread, bread of life, not stone. So don't leap off the temple into areas that you're not supposed to dive into yet. Don't fall for a premature promise of worldly kingdoms when it's celestial realms God has waiting for you, if you'll wait for them. And the Lord knows it and is thus able to resist. By the way, this is another place, though, that you can really spot the differences of direction. Because in every instance, the Lord is being brought up by the Spirit and being dragged down by the adversary. And the first, let's go up into the Mount of Temptation, is what it's usually called. But even up at that altitude, what's the devil doing? Look down at the stones at your feet, not up to the angels that are communing with you. Next, what does the Lord do? The Spirit brings the Lord to the temple, the pinnacle of it. Let's come up to the mountain of the Lord and get to the very top peak. Highest point. And then what does the adversary do? Cast yourself down from this place and come crashing to its base. Where does, he, where does the Spirit take the Lord from there? Up to an exceeding high mountain. And then what does the adversary have him do? Look down at all the kingdoms of the earth. In fact, fall down and worship me. Interesting language. The adversary is always after falls. And he's trying to get the fall of Christ right here. If I can nip this, this ministry in the bud can you imagine the, the Gospels ending in chapter 4? And that's it. He came with so much promise, so much potential. And yet he fell down instead of lifting us up. Well, the Lord would have none of that either. So verse 10, his third and final response. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. I keep leaving you. It's your turn. Get away from me. Get thee hence. In Luke's version, a phrase that we're used to from later in the Gospels. Get thee behind me, Satan. When Jesus quotes that to Peter in Matthew 16, oh, when we get there, please remember, Jesus is quoting himself. And he's saying something to Peter in echo of what he had said to Satan. And so much of what he says then especially with the help of the JST of Matthew 16, about savoring the things that be of man instead of the things that be of God. That's not me. I will not savor the things that be of man. It's God that I am trying to become like. I'm the word made flesh. I dwelt among you. I'm full of grace and truth. I'm not full of pride. I won't go there. So get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee hence, Satan. I'm not going to stand around reasoning again. I'm going to rebuke you and send you away. For it is written, one more scripture to send you packing with, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Only, the only one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. First commandment. No graven images. Second commandment. I'm not going to take God's name in vain. And I've taken it. I'm his son. He said so. I'm not going to do that in vain. Third great commandment. I'll honor my father in heaven. Fifth commandment. You understand? Just work your way through them. Christ will keep them all. But here I will not serve anyone but God. We saw this so often last year in the Old Testament. God is a jealous God. And it's jealousy for our sake, not his. He's fiercely loyal. That's what divine jealousy is. And he wants us to be fiercely loyal back because he's the only God that can bless us with the things that we need. Now, what's interesting here is it was very clear that Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy, round one, clear that Satan was quoting Psalms in round two, and that Jesus responded with another dose of Deuteronomy himself. This one, where is that? Now, it's, it's understood, it's implied through so much of the Old Testament. We just reviewed some of the Ten Commandments as, as evidence. But what's fascinating to me is that the clearest quotation of that 
is actually found in the book of Moses, JST, not in the Old Testament. And I, I sincerely doubt that Joseph Smith in, was making up stories in Moses chapter 1 and thought, ooh, the Christian world has always scratched its head about what scripture Jesus is quoting in the third temptation. What a cool place to sneak it in. And then erase my fingerprints. Seriously? Joseph did not know the Bible well enough to even <laughs> contemplate that, that ruse. But notice this in Moses chapter 1, verse 15. Worship God, for him only shalt thou serve. That is when Moses was being tempted by the devil, in very similar ways to what Jesus, the Messiah, Moses 2.0, is facing with the devil here. Thank you, Joseph, for restoring truth that Jesus knew and quoted to the adversary. And this one finally worked. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him, which is what Jesus had been after all along. Interesting that if we'll simply resist the devil, and yeah, we might have to do it a time and a time and another time, repeatedly, but resist the devil and the angels come. Sound a little like the first vision? Darkness displaced by light? Or how about the verse that we see in James, chapter 4, verse 7? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Ah, that's interesting. If I'll just stand up to him. See, here's the thing. One of us is going to back down sooner or later. One of us will surrender to the other. Satan is banking on you doing it first. And the irony there is... Remember in World War II studies, that you learned the German word blitzkrieg? And blitzkrieg means lightning war. And that was Hitler's hope. That if he can do these quick thrusts into enemy territory, a lightning war, and this bolt out of the blue comes in before the other people, the unsuspecting, are prepared for me, then I'll defeat them and they'll only have time to surrender. That's what Hitler was banking on. Lightning strikes. Same with Lucifer. What's interesting is he is incredibly, well, I'll put it this way. He's high on persistence, but low on endurance. You understand the difference? He persists and he tries and he tries and he tries again. Uh, I lost him. Where did he go? Oh, temple? I'll, I'll go find him there. I, I lost him again. Darn it. Where is he? Is he any high mountain? Start the climb. And so Lucifer will keep after it, pestering you over and over and over again. But each attack doesn't last very long. And that, if we can understand that, that completely changes our approach to him. Because it's not a matter of, I have to resist this temptation constantly for the rest of my life. No. You'll, you might have to resist that temptation repeatedly through the rest of your life. But not continuously. Because if you will resist the devil, he will flee from you. Now, I wish I could say that was a permanent flight. No, he, you resist, he retreats, and unfortunately he regroups and then retries and attacks again. In fact, you get that hinted at in the Luke version of this. In the Matthew, it was the devil leaves him and the angels come. In the Luke version, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed him from him for a season. Ah, those last three words are the real bummer. It was just a season. But that's important to know also. Because if you think that one moment of valiant resistance was enough, and now the battle's over, unfortunately, if you think that's the case, you start putting your armor back in, in storage. You stop sharpening your sword. Because the battle's over. I can retire now under my vine and fig tree. Oh, no. It's only for a season. And my, my wife sees it constantly in the world of addiction recovery. That people, in fact, the language used, people will say, I am in recovery. That's a present tense. As opposed to, I, I recovered, which is a past tense. No. It used to bother me, actually, when I would hear recordings from AA meetings and 
hear when people would say, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. And I kept thinking, you're not anymore. You repented, you've been forgiven, you're sober. When they say, I'm, an, I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic and I've been sober for 48 years. And it's like, that's, that's like my entire lifetime. <laughs> Half a century, you're good. Quit calling yourself an alcoholic. Now, I think there's some truth to that. Don't define yourself by your worst moments. But I have come, especially with my wife's help, to see the beauty of that admission, that the temptation's just around the corner, if I allow it to be. The bait is present, so I don't allow myself to get hungry. I fill myself on, on better things. I'm in recovery. But Satan is only a short season away. And so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly sharpening my sword. I'm always buffing my armor. And I'm still in training. Because the same intensity on my part that allowed me to resist the devil the first time, that had him flee, is the same intensity that I need to resist in the second and the third and the 500th and the 10 millionth and however long it takes until he's finally cast into the bottomless pit. And he who holds the keys locks it shut. I hope that we can resist the devil every time he comes. The Savior did exactly that. And with that, the story ends. In fact, in the Matthew version, the very next verse says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And we're off and running. He resisted the devil, he overcame him, the angels came to minister unto Jesus, and right on the heels, he's not thinking about himself and basking in the glow of his victory, he's thinking of others. And he catches wind that his cousin, his forerunner, is, has been imprisoned. I gotta go. I gotta serve. I gotta help. <laughs> I'm not the only one that's been facing adversaries. John has faced a huge one of his own. But what's interesting in this case there's a JST of this passage that changes things considerably. It's not a matter of the angels coming to congratulate Jesus, but rather Jesus sending the angels to comfort and console his friend. In the JST of Matthew 4, verse 11 and 12, And now Jesus knew that John was cast into prison, and he sent angels and behold, they came and ministered unto him, and Jesus departed into Galilee. The, in the JST, the angels weren't coming to minister to Jesus. He was sending the angels to minister unto John, which I think is fascinating. Now, one last thing to say about these temptations, and, and then we're, we've kind of hit the midpoint uh, of our lesson, of our study this week. These three temptations, you've got to master them because that's all there are. Satan has so many ways to approach us. Remember King Benjamin lost, lost, uh, loses count? <laughs> and he says, I can't tell you every way you can commit sin. That's how creative and original the adversary is. But on the other hand, he's, he's not that creative. Or I should say, he has to be that creative because he only has three ingredients to work with. And so what can I do with these three types of temptation? and dress them up with some flavor here, add a little spice there, or put them in a different order or different guys, but they always boil down to those three. In, in music, they often, there's many a, a symphony called variations on a theme. And so here's the theme, and then it's just gonna be all kinds of variations, that's all it is. Uh, certain chord progressions you hear in music, and, and it's, it's the same chord progression. But it's amazing how many songs come out of the same progression of chords. And the same is true of this. Really, there are only three weapons up the adversary's sleeve. And they are changing stones to bread, leaping from the temple, and worshiping Satan in exchange for all the kingdoms and the power and the glory of the world. Can I give you a chart, since we seem to enjoy those, at least I do? If you consider these as three types of temptations instead of simply three temptations, then here's the type. The first one, stones to bread, is a lust of the flesh. It's a sin of physical appetite. 
The second leap from the temple is the problem of pride. <laughs> the world's going to see you. I mean, they'll come rushing. So throw yourself down so they can then lift you up. He's appealing to that sense of self on Jesus' part. And then the third, earthly kingdoms, that's pretty straightforward. That's worldliness. That's materialism. Wealth and pride and, excuse me, wealth and power and prestige, it plays into pride. Okay, that these three are well connected. But then think about what the adversary does with, with the whole collection. Stones to bread, lust of the flesh. He's trying to satisfy the body and its needs, some kind of hunger. Whereas pride is there to satisfy the mind, what I think of myself, what everyone else seems to think of me, of me too. And then worldliness and materialism, that in a way satisfies both. Both the body and the mind can be well taken care of. This hit me in the Old Testament years ago. Uh, and we talked about this last year. When we met, there were only three kings of united Israel. Uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then the kingdom splits and we got north and south and problems from then on out. Only three had it all together. And it dawned on me once when I was studying it. They all three fell. Men of incredible potential and goodness and chosenness. And they all fell succumbing to a different kind of sin. First, King Saul, what happened to him? Well, the glory and power went to his head. And when they came back after David and Goliath, singing that Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? Wait a minute, you're giving him more glory than me? How dare you? Saul succumbed to pride. Fast forward, and what did David do? Well, he succumbed to the lust of the flesh when he saw Bathsheba bathing on from his roof. And then Solomon... Yeah, seven years building the Lord's house, but then 13 building his own. So many wives and concubines. Why? To have all these diplomatic relations and marry into the kingdoms of the world so that the wealth of the world could continue flowing into the coffers of King Solomon. Stones to bread, there's King David. Leap from the temple, there's King Saul. Kingdoms of the world, there's King Solomon. And again, to put in perspective who Jesus is, the same sins that brought down the kings of united Israel couldn't touch the king of kings. He overcame them all. Now, at the end of this year, when we get to the book of Revelation, which is such a fitting climax to the New Testament, you will meet Babylon in so many different guises, so many different forms. One of them you will meet is a, a, a whore, a prostitute, dressed in scarlet. She represents the religious aspect of Babylon, the philosophical aspect of Babylon, the ideological aspect of Babylon. And she is turning stones to bread every chance she can. She's trying to convince people to give in to the lusts of the flesh, to satisfy those kinds of appetites, and, and that it's all okay to do. Sound like the ideologies of the world? Eat, drink, and be merry, or good is evil, and evil is good. If I can convince you that it's right, then of course you'll succumb to it. It's all, it's all fine. So beware of the scarlet whore. The second that you'll see, or another aspect of Babylon in the book of Revelation, is the beast. And the beast represents political Babylon. We talk about the American eagle, or the British lion, or the Russian bear. Beasts set on devouring one another. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, okay? So to have that power, that pride, that's leaping from the temple. And you see that in the beasts of Babylon. And then third, the earthly kingdoms. What do you see in, in the book of Revelation? You see a merchant city. Babylon itself, and this is the economic aspect of it. Buying and selling everything you could possibly want, including the souls of men. Well, look at all these kingdoms of the earth and the glory and power thereof and worship me and they're all yours for the taking. I find it fascinating that through Old Testament history, through the prophecy of the last days, we are still being hunted by the wild beasts of the wilderness that Jesus overcame so long ago. If you'll even pay attention elsewhere in Scripture, the Book of Mormon is the best example I can think of you will see these three temptations come together over and over and over again. Turn to 1 Nephi 13, 8 and 9. 
and he describes the great and abominable church, aka the great and spacious building from his father's dream, and lets you know what they're after. Behold the gold and the silver and the silks and the scarlets and the fine twined linen and the precious clothing. How's that for temptation number three? The worldliness, the materialism. And the harlots. How's that for temptation number one? The lust of the flesh. Those are the desires of this great and abominable church. And also for the praise of the world. There's pride. Leap from the temple. Show how important you are. For the praise of the world do they destroy the saints of God and bring them down into captivity the direction Lucifer's always leading us. You understand now what we're up against with this great and spacious building? It's built of the stones that Satan wanted Jesus to turn into bread. It floats above the earth as high as the pinnacle of the temple. And in fact, it's made to look just like the earthly kingdoms that the adversary is offering us. Fast forward in the Book of Mormon, and when Nephi passes the mantle to his brother Jacob, There is wickedness in Jacob's day, and he calls it out. And it's the same three temptations that we just studied. Jacob chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Now it came to pass that the people of Nephi, under the reign of the second king, began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices. Guess what they are? Such as like unto David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. There's stones to bread. Yea, and they also began to search much gold and silver, there's kingdoms of the world, and began to be lifted up somewhat in pride, there's leap from the temple. Later when you get to Mosiah 11 and see King Noah and his wicked priests come onto the scene, what are they after? Whoredoms, temptation number one. High taxes, temptation number three. In order to be lifted up in the pride of their hearts and look down upon the people that are beneath them, temptation number two. It's all the same stuff. Satan tweaks it and varies the theme, but he hasn't come up with a new theme since the war in heaven. Why would he have to? They always seem to work. When you see the wicked of Ammonihah, same problems. The doctrine of Korahor, same problems. You understand that all of them, in some ways, are sins against patience, (laughs) sins against trust in God. If you'll just w- wait and, and have faith and believe and trust that I'm going to come through for you, I will. I will give you, you don't have to ch- change stones to bread. I'm the bread of life. I'll offer myself to you. You don't have to leap from the temple. I want to bring you up to the top of the temple myself. And the kingdoms of the world are yours for the taking if you'll wait to receive them in the right way. No, there are better ways. And again, if we'll have faith in Christ, we'll have much less to repent of. And isn't that what we covenanted when we were baptized? The Holy Ghost will lead us in that direction. We just have to endure to the end. This is the doctrine of Christ, and we have to overcome the adversary every step of the way. My friends, I I hope that our study thus far has been helpful in seeing what the adversary is up to. We're watching game film (laughs) because we've got a, a, a game to play, and it's no game. It's a battle, and the battle is raging. If we know how the Savior overcame these three temptations, then we'll know how to overcome all the temptations that Satan throws our way. That's not to say that we'll overcome them all, because we are weak. And sometimes our hunger does come when there's bait present. Sometimes the loftiness of our view from the Temple Mount gets to our head. And sometimes we're a little too impatient in seeking the kingdoms of the world. But I will say this. The same Savior who knew how to overcome those temptations himself knows how to help us overcome the consequences of succumbing to them. So if we're not as good at, as Jesus was <laughs> at, at our own times of, of wilderness, when we're on the mount of our own temptation, May we at least trust in a Lord who came to the kingdom for such a time as this.